Locles, we discuss chapter 9 of the textbook today. Here is the order of a video clips. One, changes in aggregate expenditure. Two, changes in taxes. Three, driving multipliers. Four, hot topic about social security. Five, relating the Kenya mother to ADAS mother. Five, says law and Keynes about the overview. Seven, case study of John Maynard Keynes. Eight, changes in net exports. Think about the multiplier effect. A small change in autonomous spending has the potential to bring about a huge change in equilibrium output. And when equilibrium output increases, that means an increase in employment and maybe an increase in the standard of living. A decrease in autonomous spending can reduce equilibrium output by quite a bit. And this may be necessary in some cases to keep the economy from overheating. You're beginning to get the idea that changes in autonomous spending can be policy instruments. That is, if we want a larger equilibrium output to increase employment, government could spend more and stimulate the economy. This is called Keynesian fiscal policy. An increase in government spending can bring about a boom. Likewise, a decrease in government spending or government incentives for reduced business spending or reduced consumer spending can rein in the economy, reducing equilibrium output and lowering employment, but perhaps taking the pressure off of inflation. Let's think now about how the multiplier effect can be generalized. That is, how the multiplier effect applies to every conceivable reduction in autonomous spending. Let's start by writing out the formula for economic equilibrium in the macroeconomy according to Keynes. That is, according to Keynes, equilibrium is defined in the spending approach as the point where income is equal to aggregate expenditure, which has several components, consumption, investment or business spending, government spending, and net exports. Now, if we take this equilibrium equation, we can add to it our behavioral equation for consumers. That is, we know that consumers spend A plus BY, where A is autonomous consumption plus B, the marginal propensity to consume, times consumer income. Substitute this equation up here into the equilibrium condition, and you get this. Y is equal to A plus BY plus I plus G plus net exports. Now, next thing you know, we're going to be changing this consumption function to take account of taxes. But for the moment, let's imagine we're in a world where there are no taxes. Well, if that's the case, we can pull this term that has income in it over to the left-hand side of the equation and get 1 minus B times Y is equal to A plus I plus G plus NX. What I've done is to isolate all of these autonomous spending components. Autonomous consumer spending, business spending, government spending, and foreign spending, all of which are independent of the level of income in the economy. The only thing that depends on income is this one component of consumer spending, and now we've moved it over to the other side of the equation. Well, this allows me then to calculate equilibrium income as a function of the marginal propensity to consume and all of these autonomous components. That is, if I divide both sides by 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume, this is what I'm going to get. Equilibrium income is equal to 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume multiplied by A plus I plus G plus NX. Now, how do you interpret this equation? 
This equation says that if you add up all of the autonomous spending in the economy and you multiply by the reciprocal of 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume, you get equilibrium output. You get the level of GDP that occurs in the economy when things have stabilized. Huh. Well, you can use this equation now to predict how a change in any of these components of autonomous spending will influence equilibrium output, and that's what the multiplier is all about. Suppose we focus for a moment on government spending. If the government increased the amount that it spent by $15, how would that affect real gross domestic product in equilibrium? Well, the government spends $15. That becomes then someone's income. They're going to save two-tenths of it, and they're going to spend eight-tenths of it. So take those amounts. That tells you how much is passed on to the next stage of the multiplier process as income. Someone's going to save and spend, and things keep working their way out until finally that $15 increase in government spending translates into 1 over 1 minus 8 tenths, 1 over 2 tenths, that is 5 is the multiplier. 15 times 5 equals a $75 increase in real gross domestic product. Once you know that the multiplier is 5, then any time you increase one of these components of autonomous spending, just multiply the increase by 5 and you get the increase in real gross domestic product. It's really, it's really that easy. So let's uh, do an example and we'll work this example out on our chart. Okay, so suppose we start here in this situation where we have aggregate expenditure and we're going to imagine to start with that we have um, a closed economy. That is, I'm going to ignore net exports for this example and I have only consumption, investment spending, and government spending. And let's suppose that investment spending is initially zero and government spending is initially zero and consumption spending is equal to 10 plus 8 tenths times y. That's the consumption function we've used in previous examples. Well, if that's the case, the equilibrium output is going to be 50. That is, when income is 50, consumers are planning to spend 50, no savings, no investment, and we're in a very simple macroeconomic equilibrium. But let's make things now a little more interesting. Let's add government spending. And let's suppose that government spending is equal to 15. That is, that I put a red line here, a horizontal red line representing government spending, and that's going to be 15 regardless of the level of income. That is, government spending is autonomous. It's independent of the level of output in the economy. No matter what the output is, the government is planning to spend 15. So add that 15 onto whatever consumers are planning to spend, and that results in an upward shift of the aggregate expenditure line by the amount of the increase in government spending. That is, this upward shift right here is delta G. The upward shift is 15. The new intercept is $15 higher than before. The slope is still equal to the marginal propensity to consume. So what happens? The government spends 15. That creates $15 worth of extra income, some of which is spent, some of which is saved. The spending creates additional income, and that process multiplies over and over and over until we wind up with our new equilibrium. Now, according to our formula, the new equilibrium involves an increase in gross domestic product of 15 times the multiplier of 5, or an increase of 75. So the original equilibrium was 50, add 75 to that, and you get the new equilibrium of 125. If the government decided to spend $15 in this model, it ends up creating an additional $75 worth of gross domestic product. 75 plus 50 is a new total of 125. This is what we call expansionary fiscal policy. When the government decides to increase its spending, the aggregate expenditure line shifts up and the new equilibrium point involves a larger GDP. Now, this would be a good thing for us to do if, in fact, the economy started from a position of unemployment. Let's suppose that 125 is equal to full employment. If that's the case, then with full employment out here at 125, we are originally at an output level of 50 underproducing. That is, we're not providing enough demand to give factories the incentive to hire everyone who wants to work. If we go back to the original setup, 
and we consider that our, out, that our equilibrium is 50, if 125 is full employment, then the difference between 50 and 125 is an unemployment gap. We have a recessionary gap here, and the recessionary gap is the difference between the equilibrium output and the output that would fully employ the resources in the economy. So Keynes's view of how to solve this problem is to stimulate the economy with government spending, shifting up the aggregate expenditure curve, and giving you a new equilibrium at the point of full employment. That's the solution. Government spending stimulates the economy and brings into production those resources that previously didn't have jobs. Now, we can look at this from another perspective. Suppose that we start in a situation, same as we were before, with output of 50, but now we believe that full employment is actually lower. Maybe we think it's down here closer to uh, 25. Well, now what we have is called an inflationary gap. We're trying to produce more output than the economy would produce at full employment. And the only way you can produce more output is through aggressive bidding by bringing people into the labor market that weren't previously working and bidding up the price of raw materials, making companies go out and work harder to get them, to uh, expend more effort to explore for oil and other minerals. All that pushes up prices. So if full employment involves an output of 25 and we're initially at an output of 50, then we've got an inflationary gap. That is, we should be down here in order to keep prices from rising. Well, if we want to get to that point, we have to somehow cause aggregate expenditure to drop. That is, we have to push the aggregate expenditure curve downward until the intersection would give us equilibrium at an output of 25. That is, we've got to get that red curve to move from its initial position to a lower position. And one policy that might accomplish that is one that discourages consumer spending. Perhaps a tax on consumption, perhaps uh, uh, government policy encouraging people to save more. Anything that caused people to decide to reduce their consumer spending would shift the red line downwards. That is, as long as there's a change in autonomous spending, the line shifts down in a parallel fashion. So if instead of having an autonomous spending of 10, people decided to have an autonomous spending of 5 instead, there's been a reduction in A the letter that represents autonomous consumption, a reduction from 10 to 5. So that $5 reduction in autonomous consumption is multiplied by the multiplier of 5 to give us a reduction in real gross domestic product from 50 to 25. So the $25 reduction in real gross domestic product is the multiplier at work. $5 reduction on autonomous consumption multiplied by 5 the multiplier gives us a $25 reduction from 50 to 25 in equilibrium real gross domestic product. So, you see, this is how things work. You can use any change in autonomous spending, and you wind up getting the same analysis. Shift the red curve up, shift the red curve down. You can close an inflationary gap or close a recessionary gap by choosing the right position for the red curve, encouraging or discouraging the autonomous components of spending. One more thing to point out is that you can get a new equilibrium also by changing the marginal propensity to consume. Suppose we keep our intercept here at 10, but we, through some uh, government incentive, encourage people to save more so that the marginal propensity to consume changes, and instead of being 0.8, now it's only 0.5. That is, we've encouraged people to save half of each additional dollar that they receive instead of saving only one-fifth. If we have increased the marginal propensity to consume, then, or sorry, if we've reduced the marginal propensity to consume, then our aggregate expenditure line is going to get flatter because the slope of the aggregate expenditure line is the marginal propensity to consume. So if people are saving more, this line is going to be flatter, and we're going to have a new equilibrium intercept. Now, what's the new equilibrium intercept going to be? Well, in this case, take your autonomous components of spending and multiply them by the new multiplier. Whenever the marginal propensity to consume was equal to 8 tenths, the multiplier was 5. But when the marginal propensity to consume is only 1 half, the multiplier is only going to be 2. So originally, in our original example, the autonomous spending totaled 10. That is, the only component of autonomous spending in the original example was A, what consumers were spending. So if you multiply 10, by the multiplier of 2, then you're going to get a new macroeconomic equilibrium with an output not of 50, but of the much lower level of 20. 
That is, when people are spending less of each additional dollar, the multiplier effect is dampened and weakened. So output is going to be smaller than it was when people were spending more of each additional dollar. When less of it's passed on, then there's less income created at each successive point in the chain. So there you have it, the multiplier effect at work. If you keep the marginal propensity to consume constant, changing autonomous spending shifts the red curve up and down, perhaps to close a recessionary gap or to close an inflationary gap. If you change the marginal propensity to consume itself, the line gets steeper if the NPC gets bigger and flatter if the NPC gets smaller. All of these begin to show us how we can use this graph and Keynes's demand-driven model to explain economic policy and its effect on output. You can see the macroeconomic equilibrium according to Keynes by looking at the circular flow diagram. In the circular flow diagram, you can see households spending on goods and services, a flow of money into the goods market and a flow of goods and services into households. The money they spend goes to the firms who produce the goods and services so that those firms are able then to pay income to the households. Macroeconomic equilibrium occurs when consumer spending is equal to income of households. Now, there are, in some cases, leakages from this system. For instance, if households divert some of their money into saving instead of spending, that's a leakage out of the system. They're spending less on goods and services, and that then reduces demand, which causes companies to cut back production, thereby reducing income. The way to restore balance is to create an injection that matches the leakage. For instance, the money that people put in banks winds up being borrowed by businesses who use this money then to purchase goods and services in the goods market. We call this spending investment spending, the acquisition of tools, plant, equipment, and other things that businesses use to do their work. So in macroeconomic equilibrium, the leakage of savings has to be equal to the injection of investment spending. That is, the amount by which consumers are reducing the flow of goods into households, the amount by which consumer spending falls as a result of the savings, must be matched by the amount by which businesses then are demanding goods and services. This flow compensates for the reduction of consumer spending when consumers decide to save instead of purchasing goods and services. So, another way of describing macroeconomic equilibrium is that anything that leaks out in the form of savings has to then work back into the circular flow as investment spending. Leakages equal injections. Now, having discussed this phenomenon of leakages and injections and using the example of savings and investments, we can now use another example in which leakages equal injections to give us a macroeconomic equilibrium. Let's think of something else that causes spending to uh, be reduced, another way in which household money leaks out of the circular flow. And that's going to be the case of paying taxes. When households pay taxes, they reduce the amount that they spend on goods and services in the same way that they reduce their spending if they put it in the bank. In this case, they're giving the money to the government, and therefore they're not spending it in the market. So that reduces the demand for goods and services. Tax payments are a leakage from the circular flow. Now, the government gets the tax money, and the government doesn't necessarily spend it. It could just get the money and sit on it. But in that case, we're going to have a reduction in overall demand for goods and services, which means we're out of equilibrium. Businesses, seeing that they can't sell these goods and services because of the reduction in household spending, will cut back their production. People are going to be laid off, the demand for factors of production will fall, and household income will fall until we get to a new equilibrium. One way of compensating for this is to have the government actually spend the tax money. So if the government gets the tax money and then spends it in the market on goods and services, the government spending will compensate for the reduction in household consumption. That is, G, government spending, one of the components of aggregate expenditure, is an injection back into the system. Household spending is reduced whenever households pay taxes. Government spending then can compensate for that reduction in household spending and keep the circular flow going. So one way 
of explaining this equilibrium is that leakages equal injections. We saw it with savings and investment. It's the same idea with taxes and government spending. If there's no savings in the model and no investment spending, then our equilibrium would require that taxes equal government spending. Now, let's look at a simple numerical example. Then we're going to do some algebra, and then I'm going to draw this on a graph to show you how uh, this other idea of leakages and injections can be represented in the picture we've been using. We're going to see, however, that taxes are a special kind of leakage requiring special treatment. So let me go ahead, pull this off my pad, and show you a numerical example. My numerical example is based on this consumption function that we've been using all along, that consumption is equal to autonomous consumption of 10 plus a marginal propensity of cons to consume of 0.8. And now, in my um, parenthesis here, I've modified income so that it's now representing disposable income. I've subtracted taxes from consumer income to give me what's left to consume out of. Notice that when taxes fall, that uh, disposable income is reduced and that the marginal propensity to consume applies to disposable income. Now, down here we have our general form for aggregate expenditure, y equals c plus i plus g. I'm going to leave net exports off for just a moment to keep this example very simple. In fact, I'm going to make it even simpler by setting i equal to zero. Let's suppose that businesses aren't spending anything in my simple example. Now, I'm going to start with a case where uh, income is equal to 50, and that means that if income is equal to 50 and taxes are equal to zero, then consumer spending will be 10 plus 8 tenths times 50. 8 tenths times 50 is 40, plus 10 is 50. So consumer spending is 50, income is 50, and everything else is equal to zero. Savings is zero because consumption is equal to investment. Now let's make a change. Let's introduce a leakage. That is, let's have some money leave the system in the form of a tax payment. If people have to pay five, $5, say, in taxes, and the government doesn't spend the money but just sits on it, then what happens is this. The reduction in disposable income causes people to cut back their spending. They're going to cut back their spending by the amount of the tax payment that they have to, to pay. However, not by the full amount, only by eight-tenths of the amount. The other two-tenths of the tax payment comes about from a reduction in savings. Well, after all the dust has settled, people reduce their consumption, businesses cut back their production because now there's excess demand because people aren't buying the stuff they were buying before. Then businesses lay off people, which further reduces income, which causes people to further reduce consumption. After all the dust has settled, we wind up with an equilibrium of 30 for our income, 30 for consumption, and 5 for tax payments. The five leaks out of the system and contracts the overall circular flow. So notice that instead of an economy worth $50, now we've only got $30 worth of stuff cycling through the circular flow. Now, what if government spending came along and the government decided to spend the five? If the government spends the five and taxes are equal to five, then consumers are going to wind up spending $50 on consumption when income is 55. 55 is equal to consumer spending, 50, plus the government spending of 5. Together, they add up, since I is 0, to our gross domestic product. And the reduction in consumer spending that comes about from the taxes is compensated for exactly by the increase in government spending. Now, you're probably wondering at this point, where do these numbers come from? I get the point that when taxes increase, the economy shrinks, and that if government spending increases, the economy will expand. I got that, but where did you get the numbers? Well, what I'm going to do now is show you the algebra behind this table. And from now on, when we do examples in this Keynesian model, we're going to just use the algebra directly, because it's really much more intuitive than me just presenting you with a table of numbers. So let's look at that algebra. Mercy, you say, that's a lot of numbers. Well, let's go through them one at a time and see if they don't make some sense. Okay? First thing is we have our consumption function up here, and it's modified because we've added taxes to the picture. So consumption is equal to autonomous consumption plus the marginal propensity to consume times disposable income. Now we've got our familiar uh, aggregate expenditure equation. Aggregate expenditure is equal to income. This is the condition for equilibrium in Keynes' model of the macroeconomy. Income is equal to aggregate expenditure, consumers plus business plus government plus foreigners. Add them together, spending equals income. This is the statement of macroeconomic equilibrium. 
So let's take this equation which represents the behavior of consumers and plug it into our equilibrium condition. And what we get is um, plugging consumption spending into this equation here. I do a substitution and I get y is equal to consumption, A plus B times the quantity Y minus T, plus business spending, plus government spending, plus net exports. Then I can take this term right here, B times Y, and move it over to the left-hand side of the equation. So since I have one Y on this side and BY on this side, one minus BY is now my left-hand term. That's equal to A, and notice I have minus T and B left here, so I have minus BT, plus all these terms are just repeated. Now, here's my payoff down here. I divide both sides of the equation by 1 minus b, and I get y is equal to 1 over 1 minus b times a, minus b times 1 over 1 minus b times taxes, plus 1 over 1 minus b times business spending, plus 1 over 1 minus b times government spending, plus 1 over 1 minus b times net exports. This is the formula for macroeconomic equilibrium right here. Here it is, a description. Any time I change any of these autonomous spending components, whether it's autonomous consumer spending, whether it is business spending, whether it's government spending, or whether it's net exports, then my equilibrium income is going to be reduced proportionally. And the proportion, the fraction, the coefficient, is the multiplier. If you increase consumer spending by A, then gross domestic product in equilibrium will increase by A, that amount, uh, times 1 over 1 minus B. This is the multiplier that we've seen in earlier discussions. The multiplier is equal to 1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume. Now, notice, here's the interesting term. This interesting term is the tax multiplier, and taxes, when they change, have a different effect than any of the other components of aggregate spending. When taxes increase, gross domestic product is reduced, first of all. Notice, an increase in taxes has a negative sign in front of it. Therefore, a change in taxes reduces gross domestic product. That's because an increase in taxes leads to a decrease in consumer spending. The second thing to notice about the tax multiplier is that it has a different coefficient. Rather than being 1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume, it's minus b over, the marginal propensity, over 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume. That's because whenever you increase household taxes, consumers don't reduce their consumer spending dollar for dollar when taxes go up. That's because part of the increase in taxes, households will pay for by reducing their savings. Whenever you increase a household's taxes, they will reduce their consumption spending by an amount equal to the marginal propensity to consume times the increase in taxes. That's because as far as a consumer is concerned, an increase in taxes is the same thing as a reduction in income. And when consumer income falls, consumers reduce their consumption as well as their savings. So when taxes go up, Consumers reduce their consumption by an amount equal to the marginal propensity to consume times the change in taxes. They reduce their savings by an amount equal to 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume times the change in taxes. This is the important insight behind the tax multiplier. The important insight is that when you increase household taxes, only part of it comes about from a reduction in consumption. The rest of the tax increase consumers deal with by reducing their savings. Now, let's show a picture of this phenomenon. Here we have our typical aggregate expenditure diagram, and I've got my equilibrium condition represented by the dotted black line. So let me go ahead and go in and draw aggregate expenditure here as a function of income. And this is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. The slope of the red line is, of course, the marginal propensity to consume. And the vertical intercept is the sum of all of the aggregate spending components. Now, let's do an experiment in which we increase taxes. Suppose we increase consumer taxes by 5. If we increase consumer taxes by 5, the result is going to be a change in this vertical intercept. That is, when taxes go up, consumers reduce their autonomous spending. And the amount by which they change their autonomous spending is equal to minus B times delta T. That is, if taxes go up by 5, then consumer spending is going to be reduced by, in our case, 
0 0.8 times 5, or 4, autonomous consumption is reduced by four-fifths of the amount of the change in taxes. So we have a downward shift. That now gives us a new aggregate expenditure line. And here's aggregate expenditure as a function of income now that taxes have gone up. So I'll put a little prime here to tell us that the function is different because disposable income is less because of the increase in taxes. Well, what happens? What happens to equilibrium? Equilibrium in this case is going to shift from, as we saw in our numerical table earlier, an equilibrium gross domestic product equal to 50 downwards to an equilibrium gross domestic product of 30. So what we get here then is a reduction in equilibrium GDP equal to this amount. And the change in output in this case, the reduction in equilibrium gross domestic product is going to be equal to minus B over 1 minus B times the change in taxes. Now, suppose we not only increased taxes, but increased government spending at the same time. The, and suppose also that the increase in government spending is exactly equal to the amount by which taxes are increased. That is, we increase taxes by five, now let's increase government spending by five as well. Well, what happens in this case is that we add on to our tax distort, to our, uh, our taxed aggregate expenditure line an amount equal to the increase in government spending. So what we're doing is we're going back to where we were originally and we're going a little further because this time we don't have to take the marginal propensity to consume into account. If government spending increases by five, then we shift up aggregate expenditure by five. Now aggregate expenditure is higher than it was originally and we have a new equilibrium that's higher up on the line. So if I draw this down here and do the calculation, and you saw me do this calculation in my table earlier, my new aggregate expenditure and income in equilibrium is 55. That is, whenever government spending increases, the change in income is equal to 1 over 1 minus B times the increase in government spending. So we started at 50. When we increased taxes by 5, our equilibrium fell to 30. And then when we increased government spending by 5, equilibrium increased back up to 55. Now, is it just coincidental that we finally end up at an equilibrium gross domestic product that's higher than the original by exactly the amount of the increase in government spending? Is that just coincidence? It turns out that it's not. And the result depends on a funny little algebraic relationship that's called the balanced budget multiplier. Let's take a look at it. If the change in taxes is equal to the change in government spending, then the change in income that you get is going to be equal to the tax multiplier times the change in taxes plus the government spending multiplier times the change in government spending. But look how these two multipliers are related. The tax multiplier has minus B in the numerator. The government spending multiplier has 1 in the numerator. So if you add them together, and if T and G are changing by the same amounts, so that we can say delta T is equal to delta G, and we can just call the overall change delta G, since they're the same thing, then this is what we get. We get 1 minus B over 1 minus B times whatever the change is in government spending, or the change in taxes. Well, look, 1 over B divided by 1 over, or 1 minus B divided by 1 minus B is just equal to 1. And that means that the change in gross domestic product that results from a change in government spending when we have a balanced budget, that means when taxes are changing by the same amount as government spending, that multiplier is equal to 1. So if government spending is increasing by 5 and taxes are also increasing by 5, your equilibrium GDP is going to be increasing by 5 as well. That's because the higher taxes lead to a reduction in consumption, but that reduction in consumption is less than the increase in government spending because of the marginal propensity to consume. The net result is that GDP actually increases.
So this is a little bit of fun with multipliers. When you have an injection like government spending and a leakage like taxes, you can apply the same multiplier analysis that we've used other places. It just so happens that because of the marginal propensity to consume, we get an extra payoff from studying the tax multiplier, and that is this balanced budget result. Keynes' model of the macroeconomy is driven by demand, and one of the cool results that Keynes gets is called the multiplier. That is, your spending becomes someone else's income, and when he spends it, he creates income for someone else and sets up a chain reaction that creates a whole lot of income in the economy. In order to understand the multiplier, we're going to begin with the concept of the marginal propensity to consume. The marginal propensity to consume is defined as the change in consumption that results from a change in income. That is, if you get one additional dollar of income, how much of it are you going to spend and how much of it are you going to save? Suppose the marginal propensity to consume is 50% or one half. That means of every dollar that you get, every additional dollar, you're going to put half of it in savings and spend 50 cents. Now, suppose we're in an economy where everyone has the same marginal propensity to consume. That is, everybody who gets a new dollar's worth of income spends half of it and saves half of it. What would happen then if you decided that you wanted to spend $8? Suppose you just found it in a mattress and decided you were going to go spend it and maybe buy a compact disc. What would be the effect on the gross domestic product of your one action? Well, let's follow the chain of events that would result whenever you spend your $8. And remember, the $8 that you spend at the record store becomes the income of the record store owner, which is going to change his spending habits. So let's set this up carefully then. What you did whenever you went into the record store was you spent $8. So we'll put $8 right here because that's been the increase in gross domestic product that resulted from your choice to buy a compact disc. Now, think about the first round of results. This $8 worth of income in the record store owner's pocket is going to change his behavior. Multiply $8 by the marginal propensity to consume, and you get his increased consumption. In our example, the marginal propensity to consume is one half. So the record store owner is going to go out and change his consumption now by $4. And those $4, suppose, are going to be spent on ice cream. So he now creates income for the ice cream store owner of $4. So we add more income here, since we're keeping a tally of the total amount of income that's created in our economy, of $4 created for the ice cream store owner. Now, the ice cream store owner also has a marginal propensity to consume of 50%. So let's suppose now that he goes and spends $2 at the greeting card store. So his consumption increases by $2, which becomes new income of $2 for the woman who runs the greeting card store. So let's put this income down here for her. Now, she's got a marginal propensity to consume of 50%, so she's going to go spend a dollar, maybe to buy an apple, which adds a dollar's worth of income in the pocket of the grocer. And by now, you get the point, right? This thing just keeps going. We get consumption of one half when the grocer spends half and saves half. And then one half of income is created by the grocer spending. Maybe he buys a movie ticket. And this just keeps going, one-fourth, one-eighth, and so forth. And over here, I put all the additional income that's added whenever each successive person chooses to spend until the pieces are so small that I just can't handle them anymore. Now look, we've got a geometric progression here. The first act of spending creates $8 worth of income. The second act of spending, the record store owner's choice, creates half that amount, or $4. The next choice creates half that amount, or $2. And the amounts get geometrically smaller at each stage. Now, what's that going to give us? If we add up all these pieces, we're going to get the total change in income in the economy. So what's it going to look like here? It's going to look something like this. Let's get my pieces added here together. 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. And I can't even pick these up anymore. They're so little. So I'm going to 
But look what I've got here. They all add up to $16. The total change in income that results from your original decision to spend $8 is $16 worth of increase in gross domestic product. Now, how would you have known that? How would you have known that the total change in income in this case was going to be equal to $16? Well, you would have known it because there is a nice simple mathematical formula that shows how a geometric sequence can be summarized. That is, if you have 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth and you add them all up, you're eventually going to get to 2. And 2 is equal to 1 over 1 minus one half. That is, if the effect, if the marginal propensity to consume is one half, then each successive stage is going to be one half of the previous stage. And the grand total that you get is going to be one over one minus one half, which is one over one half, which is two. So you originally spent eight dollars. The grand total increase in gross domestic product was sixteen. This is going to be true in general. In general, the multiplier is going to be related to the marginal propensity to consume in exactly this fashion. Now, let me define what a multiplier is. A multiplier is defined as the change in gross domestic product that results from a change in autonomous spending. Say government spending. If the government spent $8, in our previous example, we get an increase of GDP of 16. It could also be a change in income that results from a change in investment spending. If businesses spend the money, you get exactly the same consequences. So what's important here is that when autonomous spending changes, that is spending that's not directly related to your income, but a decision to spend more money apart from your income, when you increase autonomous spending, the change in income that results from that change in autonomous spending in equilibrium is the multiplier, that ratio. And in our previous example, it was 2. Well, in general, the formula for the multiplier is going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus the marginal propensity to, to, con to consume. Now, since the marginal propensity to consume is a fraction, and since the only thing you can do with your income besides consuming it is saving it, then 1 minus the marginal propensity to consume is equal to the marginal propensity to save. So, the multiplier is equal to 1 over the marginal propensity to save. Now, again, let me stress the point that in our previous story, our chain reaction began with an increase in consumer spending. But it could have just as easily begun with an increase in government spending, or an increase in business spending, or an increase in the spending by foreigners. It doesn't matter. Whoever is spending autonomously is setting this chain reaction in motion. And the multiplier is defined as the change in equilibrium gross domestic product that results when somebody autonomously increases their spending. Now, you can see why Keynes was interested in this idea. Because if the government spends money, what it does is creates income for people who then will themselves spend more money. And the net result is gross domestic product begins to multiply grow rapidly, creating jobs for people. During the Great Depression, Keynes argued that the way to get out of the Depression was to increase gross domestic product by having the government prime the pump. If the government spends, then the government creates income for consumers through income checks for their work on government projects, and they go out and spend money themselves, which creates income for grocers and record store owners and ice cream parlors and, and so on and so forth. So the multiplier effect, then, depends on how much money people are willing to spend. When the marginal propensity to consume is high, the multiplier is big, and that chain reaction goes on and on. But if people tend to put most of their income in the bank, and the marginal propensity to consume is small, then the multiplier is small, and the effect of a change in government spending will be much less than when the MPC is high. So this is Keynes's idea. The model is driven by demand. And the bigger the marginal propensity to consume, the bigger effect a given change in autonomous spending will have on the overall gross domestic product. Are you worried about Social Security? Do you wonder how you're going to pay for your retirement? Well, at some point you'll get concerned, but right now you should probably be saving. 
The Social Security Administration is designed to provide income to people in their retirement years as a kind of public assistance program. It began after the Great Depression and was originally funded as an old age assistance program with a 2% payroll tax. People paid 2% of their income, up to $3,000, into the Social Security Trust Fund, which is a government administered savings plan. Then in their retirement years, after 65, they could begin to withdraw Social Security benefits, which they could collect until they died. Now, what are you paying into Social Security today? About 15.3% of your paycheck goes into Social Security, either to pay for your retirement benefits or to pay for medical benefits under the Medicare plan. You pay half of it, and your employer pays half of it. Now, this money goes into the Social Security Trust Fund, and when you reach your early 60s, you'll begin to be eligible to withdraw money from this trust fund. Again, it kind of presents itself as a government-administered savings plan. You put the money in, it collects interest, and you take it out in your retirement years. But nowadays, the fund is in trouble because the withdrawals from the fund are increasing much faster than the payments into the fund. And people are beginning to ask, is Social Security in trouble? Does it need to be saved? I'll start by asking you the question, what are you expecting to get out of Social Security in your retirement years, and have you even thought about it? Well, the way that Social Security works, people pay in when they're young, so they feel entitled to take the money out when they're old. Or if you think about it this way, right now as a young person, your taxes are paying the benefits on older workers in their retirement years. So you have to look forward to that when you are old, young workers will be paying the taxes that support your retirement benefits. There's a kind of fairness to the whole thing. You should be able to get out something that you put in, or you pay your dues now, you get your benefits later. But the system is starting to show signs of strain, and has been since the 1970s, and people are concerned that the fund is shrinking so rapidly that it may actually go bankrupt. In fact, under current assumptions, there will be no money at all left in the Social Security Trust Fund by the year 2030. What's going on? What's changed since the years after the Great Depression that have put our national retirement system in such jeopardy? Well, the first big change has been demographic. In the years when Social Security was first up and running, there were about 20 workers supporting each retired person. Nowadays, there have been big changes in demographics. One is people are living a lot longer. A person who retired at age 65 in the years following the Great Depression couldn't count on living that much longer by uh, actuarial standards. Nowadays, you can count on living 20 years after you retire at age 65. So people are withdrawing from the trust fund a lot longer. Another thing is birth rates fell in the United States after the 1960s, and there are just a lot fewer people working per retired person than there were before. So longer life expectancies and a lower birth rate combined demographically to put strain on the system, and that's why the money in the trust fund has been shrinking. Another problem is that there have been a lot of programs added to Social Security. Now, not only do you collect money for retirement benefits, but you can also collect medical benefits under Medicare. You can also collect disability benefits. And if your spouse survives you, your spouse is eligible to collect Social Security uh, survivor benefits. So the additional increase in benefits is taking money out of the system rapidly also. So what's going to happen now? What are the problems with the Social Security system, and how might they be fixed? Well, let's look first. One of the big problems with the Social Security fund as a savings plan is all the money is invested in government bonds. Congress has not allowed the Social Security fund to be invested in productive investments like factories and companies and and anything that would pay high rates of interest. Rather, all the money is effectively borrowed by the government. It is invested in U.S. Treasury securities. So there's no real interest being generated anywhere because the money is not put to productive use. That means ultimately the Social Security Trust Fund is secure only to the extent that the government can raise taxes to pay off its own debt. So because the Social Security Trust Fund is entirely invested in government debt, there is no real productive stock of capital backing it. That is, the government's ability to tax, it's effectively a transfer program that taxes the young to pay benefits to the old. Therefore, its security rests on the ability to raise taxes to pay benefits. 
A second problem is that a lot of programs have been added without providing for the funding. That is, all of these extra medical and survivor's benefits that have been added since the 1930s have been added with no provision for funding them. In the long run, the, the fund is going to have to be replenished by taxes raised on workers. But in the short run, Congress finds that it's politically advantageous to cater to powerful voting blocs, namely retired people, by giving them additional tasty retirement benefits. And there's been no real provision for how those benefits are going to be paid for. And young people notoriously don't vote with nearly the strength and organization that retired workers do. A third concern is that Congress is going to have to do something to benefit or taxes to make this thing stable. And this is where the politics come in. As I've already mentioned, these powerful voting blocks of retired people have consistently and strongly lobbied against any reduction in benefits. And you can't blame them. After all, they paid in Social Security money all of their working years. They feel entitled to the benefits that they were promised. At the same time, the younger workers are kind of oblivious to what's going on. We don't inform ourselves about what these taxes are for, and therefore we don't put pressure on Congress to reform the system somehow. So the taxes are going to have to be raised, and since there are fewer younger workers working to support retired workers, those increases in taxes may be pretty dramatic just to keep the, the system solvent, just to keep the, the, the fund from shrinking, much less build it up in any way. So, using current assumptions, the Social Security Trust Fund will be exhausted within 30 years. That means something radical has to be done. Well, before we go to proposals to save the Social Security system, let's consider uh, in, in a broad sweep what could be done. One thing that could be done is the tax rates could be raised. Now, that's going to put a big squeeze on working people. I mean, the taxes are already high in this country, and workers are struggling to make ends meet. So raising taxes is going to be a very unpopular proposal. The next thing is that benefits could be cut for people who are collecting money in their retirement years. But that's going to be tough because those people paid money in with an implicit contract that they would take benefits out at the rate at which they're collecting them. And, and therefore, there's going to be a sense in which we are reneging on an agreement if we cut the benefits. So both increases in taxes and reductions in benefits are going to be unpopular. They may be necessary, but they're going to be extremely politically painful. Another way in which to reduce benefits would be to raise the retirement age and make the retirement age somehow a function of life expectancy. People are now vigorous and working well into their 70s, and therefore there may be no need for the government to provide public assistance type retirement payments to people who are in their early 60s, and this is something that we should certainly discuss. Again, people who paid money in 20 years ago were expecting to be able to start drawing money in their early 60s, so that's going to be viewed as a change in the contract but it still may be something that's necessary. Clearly, there's no easy solution or the problem would have been fixed a long time ago. The third thing to be addressed here, besides the taxes and the benefits, is the way in which the money is invested. Maybe all of it doesn't need to be linked to the government. In fact, that's probably a very, very poor use of the Social Security Trust Fund. Why not invest it in more productive assets, such as stocks and bonds and shares in companies and, and, and other things that yield high rates of return because they're productive business investments? Why not invest in private assets? This would certainly increase the return on savings and give Social Security more money to fund its obligations. This is going to be a concern, however, because to the extent that the Social Security Fund is invested in the stock market, then the, the government is going to be under pressure to keep the stock market from crashing, which means the Fed may lose its latitude to pursue independent monetary policy because now people say the Fed needs to pump money in anytime the stock market starts sagging because otherwise the Social Security Fund will be damaged. So there's all that problem. Then there's the whole horror of thinking about the government having to be accountable for all the different investments that it funds. Should we invest the Social Security Trust Fund in companies that uh, produce cigarettes? What about companies that invest in uh, countries that are run by dictators? I mean, all this would then put the U.S. government so deeply involved in the politics of investment that it would just, you know, potentially create a political nightmare. So there we have that set of concerns. But be that as it may now, we've got three sets of plans to consider for reforming the Social Security system. And let's consider some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. First, President Clinton has offered his own plan for reforming Social Security, which is to dedicate 60% of the federal budget surplus, which we've recently been running, to replenishing the Social Security Trust Fund. And do this for 15 to 25 years, however many is necessary. and also to invest part of the trust fund in private securities. 
Now, to the extent that the trust fund is invested in private securities, then we're actually, in some ways, radically changing the social security system. However, if we just have the surplus invested in the present system, paying off government bonds earlier, that's no real change in the social security system. That's just paying down the national debt. It's a kind of accounting trick. It's not really setting aside savings that are going to be working to provide money for you in your retirement. A second set of concerns, or, or plan, are raised by another plan that's been offered by Senator John Bro. And the Bro plan involves the following steps. First of all, partial privatization, invest some of the money in private assets. Next, have the government subsidize people's individual savings, that is, cut some of the taxes on interest income and give people a tax advantage for putting money in savings accounts, like individual retirement accounts and 401ks, that will reduce the need for Social Security in the long run because people will substitute their private savings instead. And the third thing, of course, is cut the benefits and raise the taxes just to reduce the overall amount of money that is uh, in the trust fund. The problem with privatization is can we really trust people to manage their own retirement money? And now we're at this uncomfortable question that economists are always bumping into, which is can we really trust people? You know, can we trust people to spend money well? Can we trust people to take care of themselves? I mean, think about this. I'm working today, and if I'm given the choice, I don't really want to pay taxes. But I also don't want to save money. I'd rather spend now and have a good time, which means that when I get to my retirement years, if I think I can count on the government to, to pay my way, or to pay for my basic needs, then I don't have to be worried about being hungry in my retirement years, and therefore I don't save today. And this is what's called moral hazard. If I can pass the risk on to society at large, then I'm going to take more risks. And therefore, if we have a completely private social security system, it creates moral hazard and may discourage people from saving unless the government requires the savings. So a forced savings plan is one way of protecting those of us who do save from those of us who don't. I mean, I have this fear that all the money that I'm putting into my 401k plan and my retirement accounts is going to be taken away by the government whenever I get to be 70 years old because someone else won't have saved and the government has to raise taxes to provide for their public assistance. So I saved all this money, you didn't, now what's going to happen? I mean, that's a, that's a concern. But if I know the government is forcing you to save too, then I can rest easy and I have more of an incentive to save money now. So. Getting people to actually take responsibility for their retirement years uh, is one of the things the Social Security system is doing right now because the government is taking responsibility for it. So if we privatize it, we've got to make sure that individuals have adequate personal incentives to see to their retirement savings rather than relying on the government to bail them out when they don't save enough by the time they retire. The third set of plans has been offered by the Government's Advisory Commission on Social Security, and they couldn't agree on any single plan, so they actually came up with three plans of their own. Plan number one was to raise taxes and invest some of the trust fund in private markets. Plan number two was to cut benefits, raising the mandatory retirement age, and also to give incentives for people to start their own retirement accounts. And the third plan that was offered by the Advisory Commission was large mandatory individual retirement accounts. That is, privatize the whole thing. Let people start their own accounts, manage their own accounts, take the risk they want, and invest the money directly in stocks and bonds, and get the government out of the business of Social Security. Well, each of these plans has its own problems, as we've discussed, and the problems boil down to the politics of taking things away from people that they expected, and the problem of moral hazard, people who won't save unless they're made to save, and uh, the question of what happens when the government gets involved in administering systems that, that uh, involve the government responsibility for private companies. All of these are politically difficult things. So. Maybe we're going to get lucky, and the Social Security crisis isn't going to be as bad as we thought. It could be that this whole notion that there's going to be a crisis is based on faulty assumptions, such as that uh, labor productivity wouldn't increase. After all, the only problem with two workers supporting one is that that means huge tax rates on those two workers to pay the benefits that the first worker is expecting. However, if labor productivity is rising, faster and faster, then you and I can afford to pay taxes at a higher rate without a reduction in our standard of living because our paychecks are just bigger because we're more productive. So a big increase in labor productivity will be a lucky break that could help reduce the pain of making good on Social Security obligations.
The second assumption that we can call into question is inflation. Whenever we were worried about a crisis in Social Security in the 70s and 80s, that was back when the inflation rate was, you know, 5 to 10 percent. Nowadays, it's been under 3 percent consistently for the last five years. Therefore, the amount of money that's going to be needed to pay for Social Security benefits for people who are going to be retiring in the coming years is going to be less than expected. So as long as inflation remains low, that works well for using the existing trust fund to pay off Social Security benefits for a longer period of time. If inflation heats up again, then we're going to need to uh, raise taxes quicker to make good on our existing obligations. The third set of assumptions has to do with how many workers there are going to be. We've had lots of net immigration into the United States. Women are participating in the labor force in a much higher way than has been anticipated. So therefore, growth in the labor force is going to reduce the pressure on uh, uh, the other workers that, who were expected to shoulder the burden of Social Security. The final concern is with fertility. How many children are going to be born in the coming years who will be working in 2030 that will actually be paying money into the Social Security Trust Fund? And that depends entirely upon the behavior of uh, potential parents today. We've had baby booms, we've had baby busts, lots more children born in the 50s and 60s than we expected, a lot fewer born in the 70s and 80s than you might have predicted, and demographers didn't do a very good job of predicting the ups and downs in the birth rate. So maybe we'll uh, get lucky in some sense, and more families will have children who will be working age and paying into the Social Security Trust Fund. In the long run, however, we've got to answer the question, who should provide for retirement? Who should take care of people's needs in their years where they're no longer able to work? And the notion that the government should be involved pretty much rests on the belief that if you let people do this for themselves, they won't save enough. And therefore, in their old age, they will become dependent on public assistance and dependent on taxes to, for their care. If the government were to use a forced savings plan and let people decide how they wanted to manage the money, uh, what kind of risks they wanted to take, we'd still have all kinds of problems with that system, but it would be a different set of problems than we have with the Social Security system now, completely administered by the government. Where is the government's role in retirement planning? Until we answer that question, we're not going to be able to craft what we think is the best system for providing for people in their retirement years. But clearly, the way demographics are going now, there is some trouble ahead for Social Security. And the best advice to you is save what you can in your private accounts and provide for your own retirement. And also vote so that you can express to the government your preference about how taxes and benefits are distributed in any kind of public assistance retirement program. Have you ever wondered why the government spends so much money? There are really two explanations. One is the government buys public goods, stuff that we wouldn't pay for on our own, like street lights and national defense and stuff like that. But the other reason is very compelling to a macroeconomist, and that is that the government spends money because spending money creates demand for goods and services, which creates jobs. And sometimes the government wants to create jobs to help the economy expand out of a slump. Consider the biggest slump in U.S. economic history, the Great Depression of the 1930s. 25% unemployment, all kinds of wasted resources sitting around without jobs, prices that actually started falling because demand was so slack. The Great Depression was a terrible period in our economic history, and out of this period came some new ideas about the way the economy worked. One British economist, John Maynard Keynes, surveyed the situation and said, the Great Depression proves definitively that the ideas of the classical economists don't always apply. The classical economists were the guys behind the supply and demand curves who said that prices and wages adjust to make supply equal to demand so that markets clear and we have equilibrium. Well, here we were in this huge period of disequilibrium. That is, there was a lot of excess supply of labor, a lot of wasted resources, but wages and prices didn't fall nearly fast enough to clear the markets and solve the problem. 
the classical economists said, look, stand back and wait. In the long run, prices will adjust to eliminate the depression. Keynes's reply was, yeah, but in the long run, we're all dead. Keynes's idea about the way the economy works is grounded on his insight that your spending creates your income. And if that's true, then it's demand that drives the economy. Let's look at the basic idea behind Keynes's writing as we build a circular flow diagram that shows the way resources and money move through the economy. The axis of the circular flow diagram is the exchange between businesses and households. Households supply labor, capital, land, other resources, and entrepreneurial talent to businesses through the goods market. That is, the flow of resources from households to businesses follows this red arrow. And in the opposite direction, we have a flow of money that goes from businesses through the factors market to households, that is, their income. The other exchange between households and businesses is through the goods market, that is, resources that go into factories come out in the form of goods and services that then flow into households as they spend money. We call this consumer spending on the stuff that gives households satisfaction. Money flows in the opposite direction. That is, households spend money on goods and services that winds up as the revenue of businesses. Now, look at this circular flow. The money that you get from businesses in the form of a paycheck is exactly what you spend on the products that businesses produce. Resources flow around the wheel one direction, money flows in the other direction. And when income is equal to spending, we've got macroeconomic equilibrium, a stable outcome. Now, in Keynes's view of the world, what was happening was that people were not spending enough money. A sudden reduction in consumer spending created a disequilibrium. And here's how it worked. Suppose people were afraid of uh, the depression. That is, they were afraid of losing their job or they'd already lost their job and didn't know how bad things were going to get. So they started, instead of spending, saving money instead. Now, when people start saving money, that's a leakage out of the circular flow. Because they're saving, now with their given amount of income, they're spending less. Now, in the original situation, when consumers cut back their spending, stuff begins to accumulate on the shelves of the business. Their inventories pile up because they're not selling as much stuff as they've made. The response of a reasonable businessman or woman in that case is to cut back production. So what happens in that case is that the accumulation of inventories leads businesses not to hire as much labor and capital and other stuff because they don't want to make as much output because consumers aren't buying it. What begins to happen then is that income shrinks as people are laid off and factors are unemployed. Then what happens is people reduce their spending even further because they don't have as much income. And the spiral continues until we wind up with a shrinking economy, less spending and less income. In equilibrium, it always has to be true that what people are paid in income is equal to what they spend on goods and services. So if people are saving, then the overall economy is going to be shrinking. That is, unless somebody injects that money back into the economy in the form of spending. And this was Keynes' idea about how to get out of the Great Depression. He said, what if, since people are hoarding their money and saving and not spending, what if we introduce government spending to fill the gap? That is, what if the government steps in and spends money that it doesn't have? That is, the government undertakes deficit spending. If the government undertakes deficit spending, then what happens is resources flow from the goods market into the government to compensate for the stuff that consumers aren't buying, and the government prints money and pumps it back into the goods market to compensate for what people are saving. So you see, the leakage out of the system is made up over here by government spending that pushes money back in. If consumers won't spend it, then let the government spend it instead. And that restores equilibrium with the higher amount of income, the higher amount of spending. All that has to happen is any leakage out of the system is compensated for by an injection back in. Keynes's view was you can prevent unemployment and cause the economy to expand by having the government spend equivalent to what people were trying to save. Now, savings is not the only leakage out of the economy, and government spending is not the only possible injection. In fact, other leakages include taxes. It could be that the government is imposing taxes, taking money away from people and reducing the amount they can spend on goods and services. Taxes 
just like savings, constitutes a leakage out of the system. And the government is not the only entity that can spend money. Businesses can also spend money. So here we have another way of thinking about Keynes' equilibrium. In equilibrium, all of the money that is leaking out in the form of savings and taxes, that is the sum total of leakages, has to equal the sum total of injections. That is, whether it's businesses or the government that's spending the money, in equilibrium it must be true that savings and taxes is going to be equal to business spending and government spending. If we have an open economy where we allow for imports and exports, then we also have an injection from foreigners. That is, foreigners spend money on our goods and services, too, which flow overseas. So Keynes's view is it doesn't matter whether businesses increase their spending, the government increases their spending, or foreigners increase their spending. In the end, it's going to be true that any time there are injections of demand back into the system, that's going to increase income and give us a larger economy and equilibrium. So there are two ways of thinking about Keynes's view of the world. One is that income equals spending in equilibrium. And if the government or businesses or foreigners increases their spending, they're going to cause the economy to grow. Because when they spend, they create income for households, and that leads households to increase their consumption as well. The other way to think about Keynes's insight is that anything that leaks out of the economy has to be injected back in by somebody. Now, one problem with Keynes's model is Keynes holds prices constant, which makes it hard then to examine the effect of changing prices on the economy. If you're holding something constant, you can't look at how things are changing. So what we're going to do then is we're going to modify Keynes's model by asking the question, how would it change the flow of resources in our economy if the price level went up? Well, there are three effects of the price level that would, we could see in this model. The first is, when the price level goes up, people need to hold more cash to do their shopping because price tags are demanding more cash to buy their groceries. When people try to get more cash, they go to the bank, everybody wants to get cash to do their shopping, they're going to drive up the interest rate, which is the price of money. And businesses, seeing higher interest rates, will delay their investment spending because investment spending usually relies on borrowed money. The higher the interest rate, the more it costs to borrow money, and the harder it is to get money to do business investment. The less profitable it is to pay those higher finance charges to build a new factory or to buy new equipment. So higher prices lead to more demand for money, lead to higher interest rates, lead to less business spending. And that shrinks the economy and leads in equilibrium to less income. The second effect of higher prices is that consumers say, whoa, my savings account won't buy as much. Now that prices are higher, the value of my savings account in goods and services has shrunk. And with the shrinking purchasing power of your wealth, you buy less. So consumer spending falls when the prices are higher because of the wealth effect. The third consequence of higher prices is that foreigners won't buy your goods. They'll buy their own substitutes in, in other countries instead. So higher prices in your economy makes it less attractive to foreigners, and therefore your exports fall, and then your economy shrinks and output is lower. We can show the effect of prices on the economy in the aggregate demand curve. The aggregate demand curve summarizes the relationship between prices and output in equilibrium in the economy. As prices are higher because of higher interest rates and investment spending being reduced, because of shrinking purchasing power of wealth and lower consumption, and because of higher prices that deter foreigners from buying your country's goods, then the consequence is going to be lower equilibrium income. Keynes's model can be summarized with this equation. Spending equals income. That is, the income of the economy in equilibrium is equal to the combined spending of consumers, businesses, the government, and foreigners in the form of net exports. Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. The effect of prices on all of these components of spending is what gives us the aggregate demand curve. Remember, the main idea of Keynes is the economy is driven by demand. And the way you pump up the economy is you stimulate demand by giving these different agents incentives to spend more.
We're ready to build a model of the macroeconomy, a model that shows us how prices, output, and the money supply are related to one another. What would a model of the macroeconomy look like? We know what a model of an individual market looks like. Say this is the market for onions. There's the demand curve that explains the behavior of people who buy onions. There's the supply curve that explains the behavior of people who sell onions. The buyers and the sellers get together in a market, and through the bidding mechanism, they establish an equilibrium price and quantity. That is a price at which the quantity of onions demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. The market clears, the outcome is stable, and according to analysis in microeconomics, gains from trade are maximized under certain circumstances, and we can be very happy about the outcome. What does equilibrium look like in the market as a whole? That is, is the macroeconomy like the market for onions, or is it different in some fundamental way? The classical economists, that is, the disciples of Adam Smith, believed that the macroeconomy worked just like the market for onions. It was like one big supply and demand apparatus interacting with prices and wages constantly adjusting to keep us in equilibrium. The way the classical economists saw the problem of the business cycle was as follows. That is, there's some wage that's established, and you can think of the wage as the price of labor. And at the going wage, there's a demand for labor, which represents the behavior of businesses. And there's a supply of labor, which represents the behavior of households. And if the wage is above the equilibrium wage, then what you wind up with is a larger quantity of labor supplied than the quantity demanded. And we call all that excess supply of labor, unemployment. Now, according to the classical economists, this period of unemployment is going to set in motion a bidding mechanism. That is, the workers who can't find employment at this wage will be willing to work for a slightly lower wage, and a bidding mechanism will kick in. Meanwhile, over here, as the wage begins to drop through this adjustment process, some businesses decide they want to hire labor that they weren't previously planning to hire. Rather than using machines or simply not producing at all, they will hire the workers as the wage falls. As the quantity demanded increases and the quantity of labor supply decreases, we head for the point where quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal. That is, the wage adjusts downward to eliminate unemployment. In the classical view of the world, unemployment was a disequilibrium phenomenon that would signal wages to drop, and as wages fall, unemployment would be resolved automatically, kind of like the way any excess supply is resolved in any well-functioning market. The classical economists also had a view of the way the macroeconomy worked. That is, any time a business is producing output, by selling that output, they are creating income for the workers of that business, who can then use their income to buy the stuff that businesses are producing. You might say that supply creates its own demand. In fact, Jean-Baptiste Say said exactly this. This is Say's law, a kind of idea about equilibrium in the macroeconomy. That is, when businesses produce stuff, the stuff they produce and sell becomes the income of the workers who then turn around and buy the stuff. Everything that's produced automatically creates a market by generating income for the people who are the customers of the store. So if you take Say's law and you take the classical view of the way prices adjust to give us equilibrium, you can be pretty optimistic that the macroeconomy is going to adjust to a period of stability. That is, the macroeconomy is self-adjusting. Wages and prices adjust to clear up problems like unemployment. Well, the classical view of the world was threatened and eventually laid waste to by the most important economic news of the first half of the 20th century, and that was the Great Depression. Here we have 10 years in the 1930s where output falls by about 40 percent, and unemployment hovers around 25 percent for many years, and wages don't adjust to resolve the problem. That is, wages simply don't fall. Now, why don't wages fall? There's several explanations. Employers may decide to pay their workers a very high wage to motivate them out of fear of losing their job. The wage may be above equilibrium so that workers get enough to uh, provide healthy meals and health care. It may be that workers get paid more than the equilibrium wage so that the employers can attract highly qualified workers. 
There are several explanations for the so-called efficiency wage. It may also be that there's a minimum wage law that puts a floor on how far wages can drop. It may also be that labor unions, through their strength, keep wages above equilibrium. But as long as wages don't adjust, as long as they are sticky downwards, that is, as long as wages are pushed up in periods of strong labor demand more easily than they are pulled down during period of slack demand, this adjustment mechanism doesn't work as rapidly as the classical economists imagine. In fact, it may not really work at all. John Maynard Keynes thought about where the Depression came from. And whenever the classical economists argued with Keynes, when the classical economists said that eventually falling wages would eliminate the Depression, Keynes came back with the quip, yes, in the long run, falling wages will solve the problem, but in the long run, we are all dead. Keynes said the problem is that wages are sticky, and once wages are sticky, unemployment can persist for long periods of time. The solution, Keynes said, is to stimulate demand. That is, if people would just spend more money, businesses would have to hire more labor to produce the goods and services and thereby reduce unemployment, that is, provide more jobs. Keynes said that in an environment where wages were sticky downwards, unemployment could persist. And once unemployment was persisting in the face of sticky wages, once the bidding mechanism was failing to do the job that the classical economists imagined it would do, then it becomes all about demand. When demand is stronger, whenever people will buy more goods and services, then firms have to hire more labor to produce those goods and services. Then people wind up with more income and they spend more money. So for Keynes, the solution to the problem was increasing demand. And if households wouldn't buy goods and services, that is, if the households were afraid to spend money, never knowing whether they were going to have a job tomorrow, trying to hoard money out of fear of their situation getting worse, if the households kept their savings high and wouldn't spend, then the government would have to step in and fill the gap. It was Keynes's prescription that increased government spending could increase demand, stimulate the economy, and reduce unemployment, that is, put the economy back to work. This was Keynes's view. Now, Keynes's view ignores several things that are going to be important to us in the study of macroeconomics. For example, it um, ignores um, adjustment in the overall price level in the economy. There's not really anything Keynes can say about inflation. And he ignores the supply side of the economy, supply shocks, what happens to the economy if oil prices increase. But we're going to be able to learn a lot about the way the macroeconomy works by focusing on Keynes's simple idea. That is, if wages are sticky and prices are not adjusting, then the outcome in this macroeconomy, the amount of employment, the amount of output, and everything else depends on demand. It's all about demand. If the government spends more, the economy is stimulated. If consumers spend more, the economy is stimulated. If businesses spend less, the economy contracts. In Keynes's view of the macroeconomy, demand drives it all. Now we're going to take this insight and build a model carefully around it using graphs and a little bit of algebra to show how a demand-driven macroeconomy works. Seventy years ago, the world economy was mired in a deep depression, and the question in the minds of policymakers and academics alike was, why doesn't this situation correct itself? The classical economists had taught the faith that wages and prices would adjust to restore the equilibrium between supply and demand, and if there was a lot of slack demand for labor, then wages would fall until businesses wanted to hire the workers and unemployment was reduced. However, this didn't happen. Wages and prices didn't fall in the 1930s by very much, and instead there were unemployment rates of 25% and higher in some countries of the world. Enter John Maynard Keynes, an economist with an original idea. John Maynard Keynes was trained in mathematics and became an economic professor at Cambridge University in England. 
His original idea was that if wages and prices are fixed or sticky because of some other problems with adjustment in the economy, then what would happen in a period of slack demand would be unemployment, depression, and the misery that the world was witnessing in the 1930s. Keynes's policy prescription was that businesses and consumers should increase their spending so as to lift the economy out of this depression. But if businesses and consumers were gloomy and wouldn't increase their own demand, the government should step in and make up for the demand that consumers and businesses weren't exerting. So government policy could lift the economy out of depression by stimulating demand. Keynes's thought was at odds with the thought of classical economists who worked in the tradition of Adam Smith. The belief of the classical economists was that wages and prices adjusted to clear the market. So Keynes's idea was very radical because it questioned a central tenet of economics, that is the adjustment of wages and prices. Now, what began to happen quite quickly could be described as a Keynesian revolution. In 1936, Keynes published his general theory of employment, interest, and money. In it, he laid out the ideas of demand driving the economy in a situation where prices and wages were sticky. Keynes died in 1946, shortly before his ideas had achieved general worldwide currency. Academics in the late 40s and 1950s came to agree that Keynes understood the economy correctly, and they had the evidence of the 1930s and 40s to back them up. That is, the New Deal spending in the United States under the Roosevelt administration did wonders for the economy, but not as much wonder as World War II did. When the economy geared up for wartime production, people were put back to work, and the increase in income led to an increase in consumption and vigorous economic health. By the 1950s, academics understood that Keynes's ideas had merit, and by the 1960s, they had thoroughly infiltrated governments around the world. Fiscal policy was understood to be a great way to stimulate your economy out of a recession and to slow your economy down when it was booming too vigorously. By the 1960s, economists and government policymakers could say, we are all Keynesians now. Keynes's view had come to dominate the economic scene. The 1970s, however, put Keynes's thought on bad times. We observed in the 1970s high oil prices at the same time that the economy slipped into recession. That is, the efforts of the government to stimulate the economy through increased government spending seemed to lead only to inflation and not to increases in employment and output. So the 1970s tested faith in Keynes's theories. In the 1980s, however, economists came to reformulate Keynes's ideas, putting them on sure microeconomic foundations. That is, many of the reasons for which wages and prices were presumed to be sticky were re-examined and made more sophisticated. And in light of these new theories, Keynes's ideas were rehabilitated and restored to popularity. In the 1990s, and as we enter the 21st century, there is a whole group of people who trace their economic roots to John Maynard Keynes. The new Keynesians look for ways of explaining why wages and prices might be sticky and why demand does indeed drive the economy. Keynes was an enigmatic personality and someone who was obviously greatly respected by his students and quite influential at the highest levels of government. He was someone who believed in the power of ideas. One of his most famous quotations is this, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or evil. Keynes's ideas are very much with us today. And in fact, they are still in dialogue with the classical economists whose own ideas have been made more sophisticated. This is what the excitement in macroeconomics is all about. Keynes, who can rightfully be called the father of modern macroeconomics, founded macroeconomics on a radical idea that was with, at odds with the classical economists. The classical economists have come back with their own formulation of why the Great Depression happened and how government policy may or may not be able to help. 
the debate between the Keynesians and the monetarists keeps changing forms as both sides make their arguments more sophisticated and more rigorous. But it is Keynes's influence that is still felt in economics today because his original idea changed the way people thought about what caused depressions and how to get out of them. If you look closely at the circular flow diagram, you can see two ways of describing equilibrium in Keynes's view of the macroeconomy. One view says that spending has to equal income. That is, what flows around the outside of the circle on top has to come back on the bottom. Another view says that anything that leaks out of the circular flow has to be injected back in at some point. That is, all of the money that households don't spend on goods and services, what they save by putting in the bank or a mutual fund, what they pay in taxes, sending to the government, has to flow back in because when their demand is reduced, demand has to increase somewhere else to compensate. Either businesses buying goods and services with the money that households have lent to banks, or the government buying goods and services with the tax funds that households have paid. Let's now add one more set of players to the circular flow before we take a final look at the equivalence of the income approach and the savings approach to describing macroeconomic equilibrium. The last set of players that we're going to add is the rest of the world, that is, people outside of the U.S. economy. In this case, the rest of the world represents um, the movement from a closed economy to an open economy. That is, once we're including the behavior of foreigners now, we're talking about the place of this particular economy in the rest of the world. And here's how foreigners enter the picture. Foreigners buy stuff from our economy. We call that our exports, the goods and services we send abroad. We also buy stuff from foreign countries. We call that our imports, the goods that we purchase that are shipped to us from abroad. Now, the difference between our exports, that is, what we sell to foreigners, and our imports, what we buy from foreigners, is called our net exports. And our net exports is a flow of goods and services to the abroad. We call this an injection into the circular flow because it is demand that is injected back into the system when foreigners want to buy our stuff. Now, net exports the relationship between the amount of goods that we're able to sell to foreigners and what we buy from them depends on several factors. First of all, it depends on preferences. When people in the domestic economy decide they like foreign goods, they'll import more of them. When foreigners decide they want more of our products, then we'll be able to export more. Next, it depends on income. When income increases in our domestic economy, we're going to spend part of that on exports. And net exports can shrink when our economy is booming because our import bill will rise. A third factor is trade barriers, tariffs, quotas, and other government-negotiated restrictions on trade. When those occur, it may be difficult for us to export, or when our own government imposes tariffs, it's harder for us to import goods. A fourth factor is the exchange rate. Whenever the value of the U.S. dollar changes relative to the value of the German mark, people in both economies will adjust their behavior. When the dollar becomes relatively strong or expensive, then Germans are less inclined to buy goods from the United States because they're more expensive measured in terms of German marks, their home country currency. On the other hand, Americans are very excited because German imports now look like a bargain. So these four factors influence the volume of net exports. Now that we've got the circular flow diagram complete then, let's look at an algebraic representation of the equivalence between the two approaches to equilibrium. That is, let's start with the spending equals income condition and use a, an identity about income to derive the savings explanation for equilibrium. Watch, here's how we'll do it. Let's start with this equation. Y equals C plus S plus T. You've seen this before. This is the um, description of what households can do with their income. All of the income that you get winds up in one of three places. Either you spend it on goods and services, you put it in the bank or a mutual fund or buy stocks and bonds with it, that is you save, and finally you pay taxes to the government. These two components are a leakage. These are a leakage out of the circular flow. This 
is household demand. This is the thing that creates jobs and business activity. So we start then with an algebraic representation of the equilibrium condition. Income equals aggregate expenditure. That is, the income in the economy is equal to what consumers, businesses, the government, and foreigners are spending on the output of factories. Now, since this income and this income are the same thing, we can set this equation equal to this one, as I've done here below. And if I cancel the C from both sides, I can rearrange this expression by moving government expenditure over to the left-hand side and net exports over to the left-hand side. Now look what I've got. I've got a statement about macroeconomic equilibrium in terms of leakages and injections, or in terms of savings and investment. It's the same thing to say that income equals expenditure and to say that savings equals investment. Those are mathematically equivalent statements that represent macroeconomic equilibrium. Look at the intuition. Businesses borrow money to buy factories, plant, equipment, uh, spend on research and development and things like that. All this business spending comes out of money that people have lent to businesses so that they can undertake business activity. But where does that savings come from? It comes from three sources. It comes from households, which we represent by S. This is the money that households are not uh, spending on goods and services or paying in taxes. It comes from the government. See, if the government takes more in in revenue than it spends on, on goods and services, then the government runs a budget surplus. And the government budget surplus is a form of savings. This is money the government is saving, and it's available to be lent to businesses. Finally, there is what we call our trade deficit, and our trade deficit is the amount by which our imports exceed our exports. Notice here I've got net exports with a negative sign. This is now net imports, the amount by which we are buying more from foreigners than we are selling to them. Now, how are we able to buy more from foreigners? It must be that foreigners are lending us money to do that. So this is a flow of savings into our economy. When we run a trade deficit, then foreigners are lending us their savings. The combination of household savings, government savings, and the savings that foreigners have lent us totals to the amount of money that businesses are borrowing to build plant and equipment and expand their activities. That means if one factor in this equation changes, something else has to adjust to restore equilibrium. For instance, if the government spending were to increase, then the government budget surplus would shrink, or maybe even the government would run a deficit. In this case, the government is absorbing more of the savings that are in the economy, leaving less for business. The only way for us to keep business spending constant if government spending were to increase would be either for the government to increase taxes or for savings to increase in our economy or for us to run a bigger trade deficit. Something has to give when one variable in this equation changes. Let's now look at this graphically. And here's our final look at this Keynesian cross diagram, the aggregate expenditure picture. Let's suppose now that net exports increase. That is, suppose that foreigners are going to buy more stuff from our economy, perhaps because of a depreciation in the U.S. dollar or a change in trade policy or a general uh, shift in preferences of foreigners towards American-made goods. In that case, the red expenditure line is going to shift upwards. As it shifts upwards now, we have more spending at every level of income. So net exports increasing means more expenditure in the economy. And I can draw that new aggregate expenditure curve in in red, so we can calculate our new equilibrium, consuming, business spending, government spending, plus our new larger quantity of net exports. An increase in net exports increases equilibrium income in the economy. So equilibrium income increases. We go to this new place where the red line crosses the black dotted line, and we get our new level of equilibrium output. Y prime. The change in output is equal to 1 over 1 minus B times the change in net exports. That's a straightforward application of our multiplier. But look what happens down below. Down below, when net exports increase, that is a reduction in the savings that's available in our economy. That is, now that foreigners are buying more of our stuff, they're less likely to be lending us money. So the amount of savings that's available in the economy shrinks. Net exports shifts the expenditure curve upwards at the same time as it shifts the savings curve 
downwards. And when that happens, the equilibrium point where savings is equal to investment spending is going to change. That is, it gives us the same level of output as we had upstairs. So see, there's two ways of representing the change in net exports, as an increase in expenditure or as a shrinkage in savings. Either way, you get an increase in the equilibrium level of output equal to the change in autonomous spending, the change in net exports, times the multiplier. There's two ways of representing any change in the economy. You can either look at it on the outside of the circular flow wheel in terms of income equals expenditure. Those have to be equivalent in equilibrium. Or you can look at it on the flows into the wheel, that is, the leakages out of the circular flow and the injections back in. Savings equals investment. Anything that shrinks the total amount of savings is going to change the equilibrium level of income. Well, there you have it, Keynes's view of the world in which demand drives everything. You've seen it in a picture, you've seen it graphically, and you've seen it with simple algebra. Now you can apply it to explain how changes in the economic environment change output, and with it, employment.